SCP-093-T2 Mirror Tests Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system, allowing for 300 meters or roughly 1,000 feet of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasps connecting these spools must be high grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-093. 1. Wrist-mounted light source with 3 hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to 6 additional hours. 4. 0.5 liter water bottles with water. 4 MREs of any type plus 2 plain granola bars. Chocolate chips allowed. 1. Standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition loaded. This is not to be issued until subject has passed into a mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision, ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return and subject to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. One standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item and must find it on his own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system, with the camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions, where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt, or a lack thereof, in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be read in order. Mirror Test 1. Color, Blue. Subject is D-20384, male, 34 years of age, strong physique, Subject's background shows instance of murder and attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a blue color. Outside, technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape, heavily tinged in blue. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right. Only grass, weeds, and a breeze moving the taller grass. No trees. No living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed, traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible. A patch of the land up ahead is barren, and grass can be seen dying as subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged, and the camera suffers a light shutter. Subject is instructed to enter the hole, and after mild protesting, agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent such as ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system to slow the descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. Sweeping gestures of the light reveal nothing more than dirt, even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source. Asked about the blue tinge, subject expresses confusion and says there is no such tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage, and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be sealing light fixtures a series of which with less than a quarter broken, 
while the others function. A series of six doors, three to a side, span before the camera view, with the seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been blocked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows signs of rusting and is typical of retail store units, suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on the right. Door is locked, does not open. Second door tries to open but does not budge. Unlocked, but blocked. Closing second door. Third door is tried. Same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does open fully, and the light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but he can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left side has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by unknown material. All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides, and space for movement is too thin to look through, even at ground level. First door on left hand is locked, but part of key is present in lock from stem to the ridges. The back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean, as is floor. Ceiling is coated in the same strange brown material as the third room. In this room, there is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow, a wooden crate containing open boxes of what appears to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles. However, subject states they simply read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appears to be empty water bottles that have dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed, no title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asks to remove clippings for retrieval. All articles but one crumble at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a field sample container and seems the most recent compared to the others. Asked to investigate the book, subject begins to move toward it. Audio on the tape goes strange, and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for 3.5 seconds. Subject has not touched the book still, and when the noise stops, subject asks Control to repeat request. Control made no requests during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave room, and notes that the door has begun closing slowly on its own, and if left alone, will close. Subject advised to leave door alone, and to investigate door on right. Careful review of the following 10 seconds of tape shows that as the camera pans, a figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open, only enough for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right with no mention of anything out of the ordinary. This door, when pushed against, moves, and after repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A corkboard is visible with more articles attached to it. The top of a box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench. As subject returns back down tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly, but control reports a sudden surge in cable movement, pulling an additional 100 meter of cable through before going slack again and then tightening. Video feed shows subject ascending tunnel slowly while control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent, but states he is not climbing. The rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides, and subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hole, nothing is visible on camera, and subject reports nothing has changed in landscape, then begins a return trip following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. 
Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving in a 90 degree angle, away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, behind subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable, and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks in control again, but subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable. It is taut and does not move. Control begins to reel in the pulley system, and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable, movement can be seen, as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling in. Then the line vibrates, as it meets resistance, and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back a long length of cable, which now appears to slowly be allowing more slack, before suddenly, all slack is returned, and pulley system begins again. Control requests subject return following cable path, and screams are caught on the audio, with panic from subject. Five shots fired as subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see subject returning toward point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing into a point, floating in the air. As subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system, and camera films only the floor. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection, and SCP-093 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from subject. A vile-smelling fluid was present on subject's clothes around his hands when firearm was recovered. This fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state having seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily 50 times the size of a normal person, with no facial features and a very short arm reach, pulling itself toward the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity, fine details could not be made out, but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field test kit recovered from subject, containing a newspaper article that reads, Data expunged, and was filed as item data expunged. The next test is classified as the green test. Mirror test 2. Color, green. Subject is D54493, female, 23 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of Grand Theft Auto and second-degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a green color. Outside, technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper, and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in Test 1. No landmarks from Test 1 are discernible, as subject pants camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field. Large, two stories. A basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two, a boys and girls, lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance, as evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lay clothes, arranged, in a descending order, shoes to shirt going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. 
After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication to subject is muted, and conversation of control making commentary about subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. Camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible, and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible in the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old, and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old, stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel, similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend, but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley return system in doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker, ill-suited to long-term storage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during Blue marked as cereal fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of this skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone, per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker, as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products are lined against the wall. Subject is requested to leave the bunker, and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample, commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it they can come get it themselves. Control declines, and subject leaves bunker. As subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment, and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there, and begins to climb. Figure draws out of camera view after first rung is touched by subject, who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously, with firearm drawn, and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject, who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out the varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings, 
All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately 10 minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling or floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open. All food is spoiled. Adjacent the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, and a television, all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop whose case also resembles 1950s decor and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system, Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. When asked to recover laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempts made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When subject reaches top of stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side, and at the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open, and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewelry and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone, promptly leaving the room. Subject asks to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window, which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible and approximately 40 kilometers from it, at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures, similar to those from the footage captured during blue test, are visible around the home, all staring up. Subject asks to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Pulley system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experienced the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Return to newspaper fragments filed as The next test is classified as the Violet Test. End of entry. To review continued testing on SCP-093, go watch SCP-093 Experiment Logs, Part 2. The Violet, Yellow, and Red Tests, right now.